Chapter 8. Looking for trouble. What did Alex find in his room last night? A microphone. A bug, which is what? A listening device. Yeah. Well, but the, wouldn't that be suspicious then? Wouldn't they be like, why are you looking for that? Why would he be going behind the pictures though? See, oh, he's he's being. No, he just he left it there, but now he knows it's in there, so he won't say anything. Okay. okay. Looking for trouble, Alex saw it. The moment he opened his eyes, it would have been obvious to anyone who slept in the bed, but of course, nobody had slept there since Ian Ryder had been killed. It was a triangle of white slipped into a fold in the canopy above the four-poster bed. You had to be lying on your back to see it, like Alex was now. It was out of his reach. He had to balance a chair on a mattress and then stand on the chair to reach it, wobbling, almost falling. He finally managed to trap it between his finger and pull it out. It was a square of paper folded twice. Someone had drawn on it, a strange design with what looked like a reference number beneath it. I'm filming for at-home learners. There wasn't very much of it, but Alex recognized Ian Ryder's handwriting. What did it mean? He pulled on some clothes, went over to the table, and took out a sheet of plain paper. Quickly, he wrote him a brief message in block capitals. Found this in Ian Ryder's room. Can you make any sense of it? Then he found his DS, inserted the Nemesis cartridge into the back, turned it on and passed the screen over the two sheets of paper, scanning first his message, then the design. In a matter of microseconds, the image would appear on Mrs. Screen's, I'm sorry, Mrs. the screen of Mrs. Jones' computer in London, along with the time and location from which it had been sent. Maybe she could work it out. She was, after all, meant to work for intelligence. Finally, Alex turned off the machine then removed the back and hid the folded paper in the battery compartment. The diagram had to be important. Ian Ryder had hidden it. Maybe it was what had cost him his life. There was a knock at the door. Alex went over and opened it. Mr. Grin was standing outside, still wearing his butler costume. Good morning, Alex said. Grrr, Mr. Grin gestured, and Alex followed him back down the corridor and out of the house. Why did he say it like that? He has no tongue. He has no tongue. Who is Mr. Grin? Who? Mr. Grin. Um, Jordan. Um, he's a guy that he throws knives at people through knives at him, and then he got slices. Close, close. Who is he right now? Um, like the assistant. Yeah, yeah. He's the butler, right? He used to be in a circus act where he threw knives, right? And his mom came to one of the performances, waved at him. He got his timing wrong, and the spinning knife that he was supposed to catch between his teeth sliced his face so it looks like he's always smiling. Yummy! He doesn't have a tongue, so he can't Okay. Yep, and he does not have a tongue anymore. He felt relieved to be out in the air, away from the oppressive artworks. That's our first vocabulary word. Oppressive means weighing heavily on the mind or spirit, causing depression or discomfort. So I don't think that this is making him depressed, but I definitely think he's uncomfortable by looking at all these pictures. Have you ever seen artwork that just makes you uncomfortable? Yeah. It makes you just kind of feel uncomfortable. So he's talking about the artwork as oppressive artwork. As they paused in front of the fort, uh, in front of the fountains, there was a sudden roar and a propeller-driven cargo plane dipped down over the roof of the house and landed on the runway. If Grin gave, Mr. Grin explained. Just what I thought, Alex said. Do you think Alex actually knows what Mr. Grin is saying? No. No. What do you think he's doing here? Trying to be nice. He might be trying to be nice. I kind of think he's being like a smart Alex. I think he's being like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, because he's kind of got an attitude problem. Right? Yeah. And he doesn't want to be there, right? Yeah. Okay. 
They reached the first of the modern buildings and Mr. Grin pressed his hand against a glass plate next to the door. There was a green glow as his fingerprints were red. And a moment later, the door slid soundlessly open. Everything was different on the other side of the door. From the art and elegance of the main house, Alex could have stepped into the next century. Long white corridors with metallic floors, halogen lights, the unnatural chill of air conditioning, another world. A woman was waiting for them, broad shouldered and severe, her blonde hair twisted into the tightest of buns. She had a strangely blank moon shaped face, wire framed spectacles and no makeup apart from a smear of yellow lipstick. She wore a white coat with a name tag pinned to the top pocket. It read, Vol. You must be Felix, she said, or is it now I understand Alex? Yes, Follow, allow me to introduce myself. I am Froline Vol. She had a thick German accent. You may call me Nadia. She glanced at Mr. Grin. I will take him from here. Mr. Grin nodded and left the building. Do you have a cell phone? Vol asked, holding out her hand. Sure, Alex handed it across. I am afraid I will be keeping it until the end of your visit. A security measure, you understand. She slipped it into her pocket. Alex was sorry to see it go. Not being allowed a phone at school was bad enough, but here, in the middle of Sales Compound, it, he felt lost without it. But it was too late. Nadia Vol had already set off, talking as she went. We have four blocks here. Block A, where we are now, is administration and recreation. Block B is software development. Block C is research and storage. Block D is where the main Stormbreaker assembly line is found. Where's breakfast? Alex asked. You have not eaten? I will send you a sandwich. Hair Sale is very keen for you to begin at once with the experience. She walked like a soldier, straight back, her feet in tight black leather shoes, wrapping against the floor. Alex followed her through another door and into a bare square room with a chair and a desk and on the desk, the first Stormbreaker he had ever seen. It was a beautiful machine. Mac might have been the first computer with a real sense of design, but the Stormbreaker had far surpassed it. It was black apart from the white lightning bolt down the side, and the screen could have been a porthole into outer space. Alex sat behind the desk and turned it on. The computer booted itself instantly. A second fork of animated lightning sliced across the screen. There was a swirl of clouds, and then, in burning red letters, S-E, the logo of Sail Enterprises. Seconds later, the desktop appeared with icons for math, science, French, every subject ready for access. Even in those brief seconds, Alex could feel the speed and the power of the computer. And Herod Sail was going to put one in every school in the country. He had to admire the man. It was an incredible gift. I leave you here, Froline Vol said. It is better for you, I think, to explore the, the Stormbreaker on your own. Tonight, you will have dinner with Harris Sale, and you will tell him your feeling. Yeah, I'll tell him my feeling. I will have a sandwich sent to you, but I must ask you not to leave the room. There is, you understand, the security. Whatever you say, Mrs. Vole, Alex said. The woman left. Alex opened one of the programs and for the next three hours lost himself in the state-of-the-art software of the Stormbreaker. Even when his sandwich arrived, he ignored it, letting it curl on his plate. He would never have said that schoolwork was fun, but he had to admit that the computer made it lively. The history program brought the Battle of Port Stanley to life with music and video clips. How to extract oxygen from water? The science program did it in front of his eyes. The Stormbreaker even managed to make algebra almost bearable which was more than Mr. Donovan at Brooklyn had ever done. At the next time Alex looked at his watch, it was one o'clock. He had been in the room for over four hours. He stretched and stood up. Nadia Vol had told him not to leave, but if there were any secrets to be found in Sale Enterprises, he wasn't going to find them here. He walked over to the door and was surprised to find that it opened as he approached. He went out into the corridor. There was nobody in sight, time to move. Open your book, bud. We're on page 106. Block A was administration and recreation. Alex passed a number of offices, then a blank white tiled cafeteria. 
There were about 40 men and women, all in white coats and identity tags, sitting and talking animatedly over their lunches. He had chosen a good time. Nobody passed him as he continued through the plexiglass walkway into Block B. There were computer screens everywhere, glowing in cramped offices piled high with papers and printouts. Software development. Through to Block C, research, past a library with endless shelves of books and hard drives. Alex ducked behind a shelf as two technicians walked past, talking together. He was out of bounds, on his own, snooping around with, without any idea of what he was looking for. Trouble, probably. What else could there be to find? He walked softly, casually, down the corridor, heading for the last block. A murmur of voices reached him, and he quickly stepped into an alcove, squatting beside a drinking fountain as two men and a woman walked past, all wearing white coats, arguing about web, web servers. So he slipped into an alcove. Alcove is our next word. I put a picture on our Google slide of an alcove. It's basically like a divot in the wall where you can kind of like hide behind the wall, right? Usually there's like a drinking fountain or something in there. Like in this, he's going to be by a drinking fountain. Mm -hmm. Why did that girl keep calling Harold Sale Harry? I don't know. I think it's his, her nickname for him. Or maybe she can't pronounce Harold, Herod, because she's German and she has an accent. I don't know. Oh, okay. Okay. Overhead, he noticed a security camera swiveling toward him. He made himself as small as he could, crouching down behind the fountain. The three technicians left the room. The security camera swung away again, and he darted forward, keeping well clear of the wide-angle lens. Had it seen him? Alex couldn't be sure, but he did know one thing. He was running out of time. Maybe the Vol woman would have checked up on him already. Maybe someone would have brought lunch to an empty room. If he was going to find anything, it would have to be soon. He started along the glass passage that joined block C to block D, and here, at last, there was something different. The corridor was split in half with a metal staircase leading down into what must have been some sort of basement. And although every building and every door he had seen so far had been labeled, this staircase was blank. The light stopped about halfway down. It was almost as if the stairs were trying not to get themselves noticed. The clang of feet on metal. Alex backtracked to the first door he could find. Fortunately, it was open into a storage closet. He hid inside, watching through the crack as Mr. Grin appeared, rising out of the ground like a vampire on a bad day. As the sun hit his dead white face, his scars twitched and he blinked several times before walking off into Block D. Okay, when it says Mr. Grin appeared, rising out of the, the ground like a vampire on a bad day, what type of figurative language is that? When we use like or as. Liam? A simile. What had he been doing? Where did the stairs go? Alex slipped off his shoes and carrying them in his hand, hurried down. His feet made no sound on the metal steps. Why would he take off his shoes? Well, so it didn't make as much noise. Yeah, because your shoes are gonna make more noise on metal than like your socks. It was like stepping into a morgue. The air conditioning was so strong that he felt it on his forehead and on the palms of his hands, fast freezing his sweat. He stopped at the bottom of the stairs and put his shoes back on. He was in another long passageway, stretching back the, under the complex, the way he had come. It led, into a, it led to a single metal door, but there was something very strange. The walls of the passage were unfinished, dark brown rock with streaks of what looked like zinc or some other metal. The floor was also rough, and the way was lit by old-fashioned bulbs hanging on wires. It all reminded him of something, something he had re very recently seen, but he couldn't remember what. Somehow, Alex knew that the door at the end of the passage would be locked. It looked as if it had been locked forever. Like the stairs, it was unlabeled, and it seemed somehow too small to be important. But Mr. Grin had just come up the stairs. There was only one place he could have come from, and that was the other side. The door had to go somewhere. He reached it and tried the handle. It wouldn't move. 
He pressed his ear against the metal and listened. Nothing. Unless, was he imagining it? A sort of throbbing, a pump or something like it. Alex would have given anything to see through the metal. And suddenly he realized that he could. The DS was in his pocket. So were the four cartridges. He took out the one called Exocet. X for X-ray, he reminded himself. What is the DS? Yeah. It's kind of like a Nintendo Switch, but what is it for Alex? Hank. It's a spy device. Putting the cartridges in the DS make it do different things. Okay. He reminded himself. Now, how did it work? He flicked it on and held it flat against the door, the screen facing him. To his amazement, the screen flickered into life in a tiny, almost opaque window through the metal door. Okay, so opaque means you cannot see through it. Opaque is one of our vocabulary words. Yeah. I think I know why he didn't want him to have his phone. Why? Because then he, he would always be focused on the computer. Maybe, yeah. Why else do you think maybe she didn't want him to have a phone? So he couldn't take pictures and stuff of what's inside. So, so he couldn't take pictures and spoil it? it. Why else? Yeah, he um, couldn't, like, contact. contact the outside world. Carly? Um, um, like, they might be, like, bad people or something. Mm -hmm. So they're going to take away their phone just in case they're going to do something to him. Yeah, so he, so he can't call, like, for help or anything. Yeah, those are all really good ideas. <clears throat> to his amazement, the screen flicked into life. A tiny, almost opaque window through the metal door. Alex was looking into a large room. There was something tall and barrel-shaped in the middle of it, and there were people, ghost-like, mere smudges on the computer screen. They were moving back and forth. Some of them were carrying objects, flat and rectangular, trays of some sort. There seemed to be a desk to one side, piled with apparatus that he couldn't make out. Alex pressed the brightness control, trying to zoom in, but the room was too big. Everything was too far away. Apparatus is our last word, and apparatus means a piece of equipment. It's usually like a specialized piece of equipment. But Smithers had also built an audio function into the machine. Alex fumbled in his pocket and took out the set of earphones. Still holding the DS against the door, he pressed the wire into the socket and slipped the earphones over his head. If he couldn't see, at least he might be able to hear. And sure enough, the voices came through faint and disconnected, but audible though, through the powerful speaker system built into the machine. In place, we have 24 hours. It's not enough. It's all we have. They come in tonight at 0200. Alex didn't recognize any of the voices. Amplified by the tiny machine, they sounded like a telephone call from abroad on a very bad line. Grin, overseeing the delivery. It's still not enough time. And then they were gone. Alex tried to piece together what he had heard. Something was being delivered two hours after midnight. Mr. Grin was arranging the delivery. But what? Why? He had just turned off the DS and put it back into his pocket when he heard the scrunch of gravel behind him that told him he was no longer alone. He turned around and found himself facing Nadia Vole. Alex realized that she had tried to sneak up on him. She had known he was down here. What are you doing, Alex? She asked. Her voice was poisoned honey. Nothing, Alex said. I asked you to stay in your room. Yes, but I'd been there all day. I needed a break. And you came down here? I saw the stairs. I thought they might lead to the toilet. There was a long silence. Behind him, Alex could still hear or feel the throbbing from the secret room. Then the woman nodded as if she had decided to accept his story. There is nothing down here, she said. This door leads only to the generator room. Please, she gestured. I will take you back to the main house and later you must prepare for dinner with hair sale. She, he wishes to know your first impressions of the Stormbreaker. Alex walked past her and back up the stairs. He was certain of two things. The first was that Nadia Vol was lying. This was no generator room. 
She was hiding something from him and perhaps also from Herod Sale. And she hadn't believed him either. One of the cameras must have spotted him and she had been sent here to find him. So she knew that he was lying to her. Not a good start. Alex reached the staircase and climbed up into the light, feeling the woman's eyes like daggers stabbing into his back. Chapter nine, night visitors. Okay, so what bad thing happened to Alex here? Millie, do you know? Yeah, he got caught snooping around by Nadia Vol. Why did this happen? Why do you think she caught him, Hank? Well, see, he wouldn't find anything in the room for four hours straight. Just a sandwich. Yeah. Computer. So, I mean, maybe she checked on him. Maybe she checked yeah. on him? Yeah. Well, he did say something like she knew that he was not, or that he was down there. How did she know that, Liam? Um, maybe uh, when he was hiding by the, the water fountain. Yeah. The security yeah, the security camera. So maybe she saw him on the cameras. So she knew he was lying. Okay, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to get onto the Google Classroom, chapter eight, chapter eight, chapter eight. Yeah, kind of. All stitched together. Okay, so what you're going to do is you are going to make a copy of slides two and three. Remember, when we do copies of slides, you click on one of the slides, you hit and hold down shift, and then you click the other slide. You go to file, make a copy, selected slides, and then you change the copy of to your name. Wait, how do we do this? So you go to chapter eight. Are you on chapter eight? Yes. Click on slide two, hold shift down, and click on slide three. Are both of them highlighted? No. Did you hold down shift while you were clicking? Thank you. Can you help them out? You got it? Exactly, then hit file, then make a copy of selected slides. I'd like you to complete slides two and three and turn it in. Remember you add from your Google Drive. So you should have both of those slides. It'll load in a second. Okay, that's okay. Perfect. Thank you. We also have Starbucks Day tomorrow. Yes. Uh, it's when we catch up on any work. If I give you a grade that you don't like, you can fix it during that time. Um, you can listen to your own music. It's like we're at a Starbucks and we're doing our homework. So tomorrow will be a good day for those of you who were gone to get caught up, ask questions, bring a snack to munch on. Sound good? Okay. Also, I have a game to play tomorrow. Um, I think we're still at only water. I think that's the school rule. I would try just normal snacks, like breakfast type snacks. 
Okay, so you're going to do all of slide two, all of slide three, and when you turn it in, you're gonna hit the add or create. You're gonna click your Google Drive, add in that document, and then turn it in.